Can people hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you.
Yeah. Hi. Uh, good evening. Hi, everyone. Are we beginning now? Excellent. Can everyone please turn on their uh, cameras? Um, thank you all for coming. I'm very much looking forward to this, I have to say. And uh, um, I'm just going to get going oh. because we have a very packed. Well, I'll wait one more minute in case there's stragglers. But we have a very packed um, panel, and it has to be a great panel. Um, so I'm very interested to hear what people have to say. But thanks all of you for coming, and I'm really, Kajitan, great to see you, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, hi, panelists. You know, thank you for we taking We have everyone. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So we are currently missing um, Naminata, who should be leading us off. So maybe we wait one minute to see if she can come up. If not, Henry, I will move to you and then uh, we'll switch to Naminata when she uh, joins us, just so we can stay on time. It's all right. Um, so let's begin uh, as we have a packed and what looks to be a fascinating panel. All examining the brand new book by Kajit and Eheka, African Eco Media, Network Forms and Planetary Politics, which came out last year from Duke University Press, one of the premier presses in, a, uh, in the US, and which is, in my opinion, absolutely a landmark in the study of African media. I think it is, from my perspective, gonna change the game, open up a whole new series of questions that he expands out of the work African literature on eco-media and going into new directions. So Professor Iheka, and uh, congratulations to him for his new um, title, teaches in the Department of English at Yale University. He writes on eco-criticism, environment and world literature. Um, but in this new work, he expands some literature into media more broadly. We won't hear from Kajitan until towards the end, but we will begin with um, our uh, august uh, panelists. And it's a great mix of different sorts of panelists with different uh, expertises coming in. Uh, I'm not gonna introduce people in depth, but I'll introduce each person sequentially and try and move through that quickly to give you a maximum amount of time to speak. Uh, about 12 minutes or 11 minutes, I'll interrupt to say there's one minute left and then at 12 minutes hopefully try and wrap up that way we stay on time and I, I don't want it to be that Kajitan gets no time to speak at the end or, or, or anything like this um, but great but thanks everyone for coming both the panelists and the people attending the panel we will begin with Naminata Naminata Jibate is associate professor of comparative literature and Afri Africana studies at Cornell University she is the author of the prize-winning book, Naked Agency, Genital Cursing and Biopolitics in Africa, which only fairly recently came out with Duke University Press in 2020. Uh, Naminata, thanks for coming and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Brian Larkin, for moderating this uh, roundtable. I mean, of, of course, I start by thinking I mean, the audience members and then so my colleagues here on the, on the panel. And of course, I cannot but thank uh, the organizers of the Legal Studies Association, this fine, I mean, a sixth uh, edition. And uh, I thank them for inviting me to be part of this uh, conversation around a field defining an important and relevant book. So uh, to Kajetan, let me thank you for making one of a kind contribution to global knowledge production in general and to African studies, taking as a point of departure the African context. With this book uh, of five chapters and through a thorough analysis, of different cultural 
productions such as film, sculpture, photography, video art, and of course, social media materials. Kajetan makes a forceful argument for the centrality of Africa in a field that has, until this book, made no serious attempts to engage the continent. If we take Africa seriously, as Kajetan invites us to do in this book, we will realize and global knowledge production system will realize the centrality of the continent and the ways in which attention to the continent will help forge the direction in which uh, the subfield of eco media studies, and media studies should take in general. By why should we turn to the continent? Before I answer that question by way of Kajetan, I will note that my short intention here will be structured around four elements. First, the book's argument, its contribution to the wider field of ecomedia studies, the text methods, and Kajetan's writing mode, or what I should say, the writing models that I think most of us should, should emulate. There are several reasons why we should be turning to Africa, according to Kajetan. Africa is a key site of practices such as uh, the extraction of elements that are essential to manufacturing and consuming media object. Think of elements such as uranium, oil, cobalt, and other elements without which we will not be able to benefit senses that new media and other media forms have allowed us. Two, Africa should be first accounted for and reckoned with because it is one of the key sites, one of the dumping grounds of toxic waste and of media waste. So in a sense, according to him, Africa is the source, it's the beginning and the ending of most processes of media production and consumption. But there is a third reason why we should be attentive to the net. That is because it's a key type of debate regarding animal conservation, and regarding ecological conservation. Because this is the continent that houses the most or the largest, shall I say, uh, so, I mean, uh, I was gonna say superficie, <laughs> but superficie uh, in the whole world. So how does one produce knowledge on ecomedia and in ecomedia studies without taking seriously such a context? I found that argument to be very forceful. I mean, forceful, because one of, I mean, the leading, I should say, the leading uh, book on ecomedia studies, which is uh, the 2016 Routledge Collected uh, 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 a collection of essays called Ecomedia Key Debates. That book features 13 essays, and but it mentioned it has no single mention of Africa. And I've gone, in order to make them, I went through this book page by page. And there was no mention whatsoever, not even in passing to the continent. Of course, it covers places such as Europe the United States, China, Latin America. 
but there is no mention of the Democratic Republic of Congo. We all know about the centrality of the Kantaga region. No mention of Niger, no mention of the Niger Delta, no mention of South Africa. And I hope that this is not coming as an indictment of the editors of these volumes. And it's not even an indictment to the leading figures of the field of subfield of eco-media studies. For those you know me, you know that I do not know if I think that we should be the one that we have been waiting for. We cannot expect other people to be thinking and taking seriously that which we should be taking seriously. But as Barack Obama will say, we are what we have been waiting for and we are privileged to have Kajeta be the one that we have been waiting for. He is forward thinking and I would say he is brave enough to chart a new territory with this book, African Ecomedia, Network Forms, Planetary Politics. Attention to the continent allows Kajetan to accomplish multiple tasks, not just multiple, but also relevant. One of the tasks that I found absolutely fantastic is the one of theorizing a new way of reading, insightful reading. He also reformulates concept, one of which is the one of free labor. He highlights major actors or some major actors, formerly unnoticed, absent actors. Those are the pickers from the dumping ground near uh, Accra. He foregrounds certain locales such as Arlit in Niger and Ho Penja in Cameroon. But most importantly, even for those who are not interested in media, eco-media studies, for me, he charts a way of writing, of inserting himself or participating in a debate that's ongoing. He participates in a debate that takes seriously, that respects the scholarship that predates his book, but without letting that debate overshadow, obscure his voice. So that's why I posit that this book not only should I mean, speak to those interested in media studies and eco-media studies, but I think each graduate student, so see, I mean, a junior scholar, who is mindful of the ways in which they write, the ways in which they participate in debate should look at this book as one of the most common ways of doing that. I just, I just hope that I have so many uh, places that I outline throughout. I just hope that I will do justice to these ways. So the methods. It is remarkable how Kajetan connects specific locales from across the world. For example, it connects the Black Lives Matter debates to the killing of Ceci the Lion in Zimbabwe to demonstrate the mutually imbricated connection. It weaves the major tenets of the negritude movement with the photography of Fabrice Monteiro. Typically for something that was uh, produced recently such as uh, Fabrice photography, most people will not go back to the negritude movement but I was struck by that move to demonstrate that what we consider today as new media should be taken 
should take into consideration old past practices and artworks like uh, Senghor's Black Woman should be read side by side with the figure that typically populates Fabrice Monteiro's photography. So these are the kinds of moves that populates this book. These are the kinds of moves that makes this book speak to both those in Black studies in the United States and those interested in the questions of race and of Blackness in other contexts. So that's one method. The second method has to do with the layering. This is a very rich book. And one of the layers that I found- Naminatsu, we have, so, sorry to interrupt, but we have one more minute. Yeah. Okay, good. One of the moments that I found useful was the, in the introduction. The introduction always adds another layer. For example, if we take uh, chapter four on Cecil the Lion and, and Black Lives Matter, we realize that he includes the movie Virunga in order to bridge together the conviviality that humans and animals, Cecil the Lion and Black Lives Matter should be in close, uh, in close courts. So in order to close, a rhetorical move that is useful that we should be paying atten attention to is how Cajetan anticipate these possible naysayers. For example, by saying, in order to connect uh, uh, Black Lives Matter to Cecil the Lion, there may be possible X, Y, and Z, possible you know, uh, ideas of pushback. But we need to make that move because this way of anticipating possible naysayers is crucial to the kinds of scholarship that we do. Uh, you know, excellent moments of close reading, brilliant way of uh, talking about free labor in the African context. I mean, working closely with uh, Mars. I'm not a, uh, a scholar of Mars, but I can't wait to see what they will say. What I wish I could see more of is attention to a place such as uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But uh, for now, I will stop here and thank you so much for allowing me to read this. No, Manata, thank you very much. I great, I mean, I think you're exactly correct. The range of this book just opens up so many different questions. It's hard to cover them all. And your emphasis in Africa is both the beginning of media and the end of in the sense of where it gets dumped, which Kajitam, it's, it's uh, you emphasize that very forcefully. Uh, thank you. Um, we will now turn to Henry Hunjo, who teaches in the Department of English at Lagos State University, where he researches and publishes on the giants of African literature, from Soinka to Godama, and on language such as Nigerian English and English as a second language. Henry, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> And um, I would like to thank Namina for that opening um, discussion. Uh, it set, the discussion has set a platform for me to build upon. Um, I must confess that uh, uh, Ihika's book has uh, presented him as an author that has uh, Uh, the ability for deep thought and um, his writing has also demonstrated that uh, he's vast in the coverage of his uh, subject matter. Uh, uh, I've never been challenged by a book as this to not only read uh, the whole book but also to think as an African living in Africa, especially living in Nigeria who has uh, that uh, who has direct experience with the deploration of the continent. So I found the book as um, a reflection of uh, Iheka's deployment of uh, his knowledge of semiotics, 
multimodal discourse analysis, literary criticism, post-colonial theoretical application to analysis. His strength in linguistics is in the book. His knowledge of cultural studies, economics, journalism, and history, and so on. So this is one book that will be useful to scholars in all the disciplines that constitutes Ihika's uh, multidisciplinary approach to the study of um, what he describes on the uh, title of the book, you know, African Echo Media, the Network Forms and Planetary Politics. The title of the book itself calls for thoughtfulness and uh, a look at um, the situation of Africa. Uh, if you, if we look at all the chapters, you know, the book provokes topics for discussion across various disciplines. What's really catchy for me in the whole text is the creativity, okay. is the centrality uh, of Africa, uh, especially in Nigeria, as a, as a, as a continent, continent, and how uh, the book provokes that has been represented me. in all the works of as a art, the the works of art, I mean, analyzed, paintings, I mean, paintings illustrations, illustrations, photographs, photographs films, films, and, and sculptural, sculptural, uh, sculptural, sculptural, sculptural so, so. Henry, you are. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, Henry, you were logged in twice and we're having an echo as we hear you. Wow, Can wow. you log off of one of the... Uh... Let's see, or I can okay. mute one, maybe. Uh, carry on, please. Okay. Now, as, now, I, was as saying, I was saying... I'm still echoing. Still echoing. It's all right. It's all right. Um, um, the, the, the centrality of Africa, Africa as, as a continent, continent is, is, is something that, that really matters. Yeah. Now, now, what is, what is the question? Yeah. Ihega seems, seems to be saying, saying that Africa, that Africa as, a as a continent harbors in its, in its belly. belly. Henry, sorry. Henry, I'm going inter to interrupt again. All right. all right. Can you hear me? You're logged in on two machines, maybe a phone and your laptop. So as a consequence, we're hearing two sides of you. If you could log out of one of the machines, we will hear you much better. Just, Just a minute. minute. Okay. Can, can you hear me? me now? We can hear you, but you're still logged in twice. So you must be on two laptops or, or two phones or, or, or something. Yeah, there we go. This should be better. We cannot hear. Before we heard twice, now we cannot hear once. So this is clearly an object lesson in media technologies, alas. Okay. Yeah. Brian, yes. Can we have somebody else proceed while no. Henry sorts this out? That Just may a... make that. That's a good idea. Should we move on, Henry, and then you can figure out your te techniques, and then we will come back to you. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Okay, so I think we should move on. And then if, if Henry can log on, we will um, return to him. That's a shame. But our next speaker is um, Tanayon Alalua, who is the director of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ibadan, and who pioneered the program in diaspora and transnational studies there. And he writes on simply an enormous range of topics in African literature, 
and media across different domains from eco-criticism to sport to diaspora and much more. Um, Senayon, thank you very much. It'd be great to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Brian, and good evening to everyone on this panel. Special one to Kat Hajitan. Um, well, my intervention is going to be as brief as possible, and um, I may not be able to, in the end, even exhaust the time allocated. Let me begin by saying that uh, this work, African Ecomedia, is uh, I consider it a transcendence of uh, naturalizing, um, you know, Africa, uh, you know, uh, precisely by the sense in which um, it becomes. Um, a kind of evolutionary projection of a much more sophisticated uh, product from um, Iheka, and um, in, in such a way that um, troubles the otherwise uh, settled uh, notions of Africa, of media, of ecology, and of course, of um, the trajectory of media itself, the fact that um, we, we tend to overrate ourselves as human beings uh, when we emphasize or centralize our agency to uh, make inventions, technological media inventions, um, to the extent that uh, we forget about the elemental um, media, you know, water, air, space, you know, and so forth, and the earth, of course. So there is a sense in which I find the contribution in this work particularly humbling, not just for, you know, Africa, but for the whole of um, the human race. Um, another thing I find particularly fascinating um, is the transspecies dimension um, to the reading we encounter in this work, um, so that we aren't just talking here about um, the hegemonic uh, species, human beings as the hegemonic species, uh, but looking at the limits of our hegemony, and as a matter of fact, the futility of that same hegemony the moment we do not take into account the value of the non-human others. So I find this um, extremely fascinating because of the way in which it pushes uh, the boundaries um, in the uh, understanding of um, eco-criticism in literature and other related areas and how, you know, that intersection of human and natural history um, becomes um, the better rendered for us to come to terms with the gripping realities that confront us in Africa on the one hand and their implications for the rest of the world on the other. The work additionally, um, in my estimation, um, adopts an innovative way to the project of decolonization, uh, whereby um, I would say one of um, Iheka's critical strategy is to be familiarize um, the otherwise um, familiar notion of decolonization so that you will, will begin to think through his reading strategy of, ins of uh, his strategy of insightful reading uh, to see um, the various ways in which um, the the global turn that is generally celebrated um, in the West can become some sort of um, source of concern for Africa. That is at one level. Now, I again take as quite instructive how 
Iheka constructs the trajectory of media production itself right from the point of vital extraction on the African continent, that extraction of rare mineral resources in Africa down to their refinement and global circulation. And at the end of the day, the dumping of the waste back to Africa. It, it works towards, I mean, through a process of uh, if you like media and technological metabolism um, at the end of which we we'll find Africa because we, at the re receiving end of which um, we we'll find Africa. Now, I must also add that part of why I find this work compelling is that it is not about the objectification of um, the sorry state of Africa um, for the purpose of um, the colonial or Western case. It is not about porn poverty, uh, much as a number of the images uh, resonate apparently with the notion of porn poverty. But like he has said, the projections are towards nudging us towards new values, new ethical values that will result in the transformation of not just Africa, but the entire world through the adoption of planetary humanism. Now, this is what I find most striking. From the beginning to the end, you find that consistency. You find that critical motive, you know, towards the search for planetary humanism. Planetary humanism in which, like he has said, um, the non-human others are also taken into consideration. And in the centering, humanity, there is no elision of that category of the, um, if you like, the planetary um, constitution. And so what then does that um, mean for us as scholars? One, I am challenged by um, Eheka's approach uh, to seize the moment, I am challenged, like uh, the first speaker has said, by his approach to begin to consider new ways, new and innovative ways of assuming theoretical and discursive agency as Africans. So you don't wait, you know, for these assumptions to be invented and circulated as it were from the global south, uh, from the global north to the global south, um, in a way that um, you know resonates with um, Walter McNono's um, assertion, assertion that um, Africa and generally the global south um, has been described and assigned um, the the task of producing data. Uh, and then you can then leave the theories to come from the global north. Iheka has refused this kind of arrogation of rules um, through the processes by which he centralizes Africa without decentering the, the rest of the world. He you know, brings to the foreground the serious issues um, that continue to dog development in Africa in the past 500 years um, in such a way that um, shows everybody that the, the challenges and dynamics we are dealing with are far more complicated than we would um, ordinarily um, have thought. And to that extent, so we'll begin to find quite interesting you know, parallels 
uh, between uh, the valuation of animals and human beings. And we we'll begin to consider, especially for the black race, the different ways in which, in which notions of domination by the West, by the white race, um, have had a way of leveling us, again, in a way that resonates with um, Ketrin Yusuf's notion of um, a billion Anthropocene's or none, uh, whereby you, you, find, you find this insensitive um, and uh, rather desperate leveling of human beings, Af the African humanity and gold. What, what matters is, is, is the extraction. You extract anyway, you dispense and dispose of the African you know, uh, body at will. And, and, and that's continued. And in the, in the present age that um, he strives to ensure and so successfully that moves from being just a mere global template to um, a planetary template, we, we see the various ways in which um, we experience in the present what I call the repetition of colonial domination in various forms. You know, how Roosevelt's, uh, you know, um, poaching, official powerful poaching of the colonial era is continually repeated um, as embodied in the character of Palmer and, and so many others. But it doesn't stop there. Um, and that's why I find- Senayon. Yes. Senayon, one minute, interrupt for one more minute. Oh, please. I thought I wasn't going to even exhaust my time. Okay, now I have to come to the conclusion. So um, let me say that um, for a very long time to come, this work um, is going to be an iconic uh, reference, reference point um, at the local level, let me say, with my postgraduate students. And of course, it is a work that challenges the entire world, North Africa, um, to continue to reflect on how to concretize the ethos of um, planetary humanism. Two questions, though, as I conclude. Um, I, I thought that um, on uh, what page is that? On page 17, um, the trajectory of um, interna internationalism by Iheka uh, makes me a bit uncomfortable, especially uh, when those previous epochs are described um, to be as. Um, conservative as to preserve nations. I am like, so what nations are we talking about here? Are we reducing it to the evolution of nationalism in the West, uh, which uh, subsequently found expression in the violent uh, colonization of Africa um, and some other parts of the world? Or how do we then reconcile such assumptions with uh, the, the, the predation of old African kingdoms, whether Ashanti or Benin Empire or, um, or, or, or Mali Empire, after Mansa Musa and all that. Um, that is that. And the second and final question is, um, considering um, the dynamics and what I call the materialities of uh, planetary humanism, uh, which allows for this productive conversation between the human and non-human others. Um, isn't it um, a new and sophisticated uh, way of um, Africa um, trying and deservedly to rehumanize the West because um, these assumptions are not strange to an average African community. The challenge for me in my conclusion then is that um, we are at the onset of uh, the rehumanization of the West and the re 
civilization of that space. And Kajitan Kiheka uh, is playing a key role in it. I would like to thank everybody. Done. Thank you very much. I love that emphasis on Africa rehumanizing the West and, and, and the emphasis on um, ethics, which is a major part of the book. Uh, thank you very much for that. Henry, we, we, we had to cut you off because we couldn't hear you. Um, if you could, you could speak for about five minutes or something, but we will run out of time. Is it possible for you to get some of your points out? It would be great to hear them. But if not, then we can uh, move on. Uh, what do you think? I think we're going to have to move on and then maybe we'll hear if we have time later. So let's move on to Marion. Um, Marion Tricoire is assistant professor at Grinnell College, where she writes on Francophone African literature, uh, probably bringing in the Congo, as uh, Naranato was asking, and also post colonial literatures and urbanism more generally. Uh, thank you, Marion. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's book panel, as it was a pleasure to engage with Kajetanya Heke's African Eco Media. Um, I share my colleague's thought about the importance of this book and the contribution it's going to make in redefining the fields um, in which it um, in which it participates. In African Ecomedia, Iheke sets out to, quote, examine the ecological footprint of media technologies in, Africa's, in Africa, as well as the representations in media of ecological issues affecting the continent, including degradation from oil and uranium extraction, dumping waste, and the politics of animal conservation, unquote. To do so, Iheke focuses on, quote, the ecology of images and images of ecology, End quote, mostly through film and photography. The book makes a strong case as to the importance of representing the ecological cost of media, including media devices, but also defends a sense of, but also defends, sorry, um, an expended sense of media that includes oil and bananas, for instance. This expanded sense of media shows common threads of exploitation of human and non-human resources, as well as ecological impact and toxicity affecting very different media on the continent. Throughout the five chapters of the book, Iheke shows the entanglement between media forms, the resources needed to produce them, and the ecological impact of their production, circulation, and or destruction. In a powerful move, Eheke includes the technology that helps us think about climate change and resource extraction, showing that the same technology is involved in perpetrating ecological degradation. The same cell phones and computers that bring us ecological awareness are built with rare metal extracted in Africa and will most likely end up in places like the Agbog Bloshi electronic waste dump in Ghana. Visual arts, quote, counteract the invisibility and forgetting the, that infrastructures relish, end quote. As such, Eheke studies media through media with an impressive breadth. In other words, Eheke's interests lie not only with what happens with all extraction in the Niger Delta, but its visual representation as well. Eheke reads these visual art projects through insightful reading defined as um, for productive insights into the conditions that they present to shine light on the interconnectedness between African spaces and the rest of the world, humans, animals, and things, and the past, present, and future. Eheke goes on to write, I read these texts for their potential for archiving ecological problems, mobilizing ecological affect, and imagining alternative world-making scenarios. End quote. While I would agree that all the examples can be read as archives of ecological problems, I was particularly compelled by Iheke's reading of the works of art that did propose an imaginary, and in so doing took part in a form of world making. Um, 
in that sense, the first chapter on when you read Kahiyu Pamsi and Fabris Montero's The Prophecy was especially convincing as examples of at once, quote, the most visceral social and ecological costs of current energy regimes, but also world making scenarios oriented towards sustainable futures, end quote. In this project, Eheka powerfully shows Africa at the origin and or endpoint of many of the media processes writ large. Even as the continent disproportionately suffers from the environmental costs associated with globalization, this model continues exploitative practices that harm people, animals, and the air and water around them. African media arts then make visible the toxicity caused directly or indirectly by media production, as well as the role the continent plays for media processes. Iheka recontextualizes media related concepts such as digital labor to include the unpaid workers of Agba Boloshi, whose labor does not receive wages, is arguably coerced, and exposes them, everyone and everything around them, to toxic fumes and health hazards. This effort to show that Africa is and always was part of the digital through manual labor, but also digital art projects such as Ola Lake and Jafis Shanti Megastructures appears as a crucial intervention in fields that, are, that have heretofore sidelined the continent. In another compelling move, Iheka investigates the concept of ecological trauma through the examples of resource extraction in the Niger Delta region and in Niger to rethink trauma as being of the past, present, and future, at once individual and collective, thereby showing how African-based inquiry can help shape theoretical frameworks beyond their Eurocentric definitions. Considering the growing pressure of ecological issues, including the rise of climate refugees, such contributions may prove instrumental in understanding ecological trauma, not only in Africa, but everywhere else as well. In the introduction, Iheke explains that, quote, media enters the orbit of eco-media if they meet at least one of the following conditions. Their infrastructural logic produces fire and or other toxins that contain elemental media, including air, water, earth. They critique human exploitative relationships with the environment and where possible proposed strategies for eco-restoration, unquote. In the artworks under study, the original media, such as oil, uranium, waste, meets the first condi condition, while the art piece fulfills the second condition, that of critique. However, could we not also think of the visual art projects as participating in industries that also fulfill the first condition? What place, if any, would that information play in insightful reading? In chapter two, for instance, Hake focuses on a series of photographs of the electronic waste dump of Agbo Gloshi in the suburb of Accra, Ghana, by South African artist Peter Hugo. A quick Google search shows that Hugo's permanent error was exhibited in several American and European cities, such as New York, Rome, Zagreb, and probably others, on top of being published as a book of photographs by Prestel Publishing, headquartered in Munich with offices in London and New York. Prestel Publishing was acquired in 2008, a few years before the publication of Permanent Error by Pendum Penguin Random House, one of the big five publishers, which belongs to Ber Bertelsmann, one of the biggest private multinational mass media conglomerates in the world. How does this information factor into an insightful reading of permanent error? Indeed, insightful reading calls for, quote, looking sideways at the context of production, that is to the history and politics of the situation offered in the cultural artifact, end quote. Here, Iheka focuses on the media represented in the images, while I wonder what insights would come out of expended this, expanding this gesture of looking sideways to the materiality of the media arts themselves, their conditions of production and circulation, their own ecological impact. This question particularly resonates since Heke notes that Hugo's work functions as, quote, as if Hugo is an unobtrusive observer, merely capturing things as they are, unquote. 
The politics involved in thinking about the photographs as objects traveling the world in exhibition and book form, being read, perhaps insightfully, perhaps not in the process, and contributing to raising revenues for a multinational media corporation, complexify the notion of the possibility of an unobtrusive observer. In a sense, the epilogue entitled Imperfect Media speaks to this question in the context of literary studies and reading, considering that both physical books and ebooks are entangled in furthering the ecological issues that some of them denounce. In his discussion of the Afrofuturist blockbuster Black Panther, Ehake criticized not only the positive portrayal of resource extraction or the illusion of infinite resources, but also extends some of the criticism to the resources used in making Black Panther. Conversely, imperfect media, according to Hecke, emerges from, quote, the creative, improvisational, and experimental impulses that scarcity engenders, end quote. In the last chapter of the book, it turns to the African city as a site of, quote, everyday precarity, a space for geopolitical chem ideological contestation that endangers the human and non-human biosphere, and a space for articulating future possibilities, end quote. Because in African cities, this is often an end and not an or, my last question is, what can the paradoxes of everyday lives in African cities and the art they generate teach us about the kind of creative imperfection that can bring about radical engagement and reflexivity in all the finite resources. And thank you for what was um, a very generative and productive read. Sorry, my um, screen froze. Have you finished, Marianne? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, we're having problems all over. I don't know if the problems in the internet or in my connection or what have you. Thank you very much. It's great. It's very interesting. The sort of mix, um, which Senayon was saying, also between emphasizing culture production, emphasizing achievement, emphasizing a positive something, not just Afro-pessimism or victimization, but then balancing that with the reality of extraction and what those histories are, the depth of those histories, and how you put the two, uh, the politics of that intention. It's uh, very good. So thanks a lot. Uh, we will move on now to um, our final speaker, but we will see at the end if we can come back to Henry. But now our last plan speaker is Paul Hugo, also himself, another innovator in the staff of literature and, and media. Um, Paul is associate professor at Illinois State University in the Department of English. He was a recent fellow at the National Humanities Center, and he's the author of Nollywood, Popular Culture and New Narratives of Marginalized Youth in Nigeria, which was published on Carolina Academic Press. Paul. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for that very sort of generous and well-researched introduction. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be part of uh, what is clearly a, a great panel within what you appropriately described as a landmark publication in African studies. Um, this is the second time uh, I would be on a panel reviewing uh, Professor Hicker's work. Uh, the first time was at the African Studies Association Conference in DC. This was in May of 2018, I think, where I was in a panel that reviewed uh, his first book, Naturalizing Africa. And, and I think, and I remember that at that panel, I had prefaced my comments by indicating that uh, we were witnessing the emergence of an extraordinarily talented scholar who was going to redefine the field of African literature and cultural studies in very fundamental ways. Now, when we were done from that panel, a mutual friend of ours, whose name I would not mention, a very senior professor, walked up to me and whispered to my ears and said, and I'm quoting her, I think he's going to be a biggie. 
Now, a year, less than a year after that panel, uh, Kajit had moved from the University of Alabama to Yale. And here we are, uh, a few years down the road, uh, we're reviewing another book this time around published by Duke University Press. If I were to use or to borrow an American metaphor, I would say that Professor Iheka likes firing heavy weapons and Ecomedia is another of those heavy munitions is pulled out from his arsenal. Um, so uh, Kajitan, I'm, I'm going to join the long list of people who congratulated you on this um, um, excellent work. What I'm going to be presenting is actually um, the first draft, which is an abridged, actually an abridged version of a review essay that I'm writing on, on the book. So I'm going to limit my comments to just the introduction and the first chapter just for the sake of time. So we can have enough time uh, to chat with uh, uh, Professor Iheka afterwards. Now, when Ross Barrett and Daniel Warden published a groundbreaking volume on oil cultures in 2014, they noted a set of doctors by scholars in the humanistic sciences to engage with the global oil economy. The editors and contributors in the volume observed that oil had been part of a modern cultural and intellectual life for at least 150 years, and thus posed the challenge to humanistic scholars to probe and forge the complex links between oil, modern culture, and contemporary dynamics of political, economic, and culture power in an interconnected cross-cultural world. The subject of all in that volume was of course a wider metaphor or reference to the extractive or energy industries in general, whether oil, uranium, copper, gold, coal, or even agricultural produce. It would seem to me that Iheka's Ecomedia is an unintended response to that clarion call by the pioneers of the energy humanities. But what is remarkable about the work is the bold and expansive interdisciplinary intervention it makes across a range of soft field in the humanities. What is particularly striking about African Ecomedia is the unique critical maneuver it makes in marshalling the truths of literary and cultural analysis in offering the most insightful exegesis of a wide array of cultural artifacts ranging from fictional text, photo essays, films, and embodied performance. Iheka literally invades many disciplines in the humanities, displaying incredible mastery of their disciplinary codes and assumptions, and gesturing to how these fields may embrace the ecological turn in the humanistic sciences. The real beneficiaries of his astute scholarship are not just those of us in literary and cultural studies, but interlocutors in interrelated fields, such as photography, film and media studies, fine arts, performance studies, urban geography, sociology, women and gender studies, and of course, his home turf, eco-critical and energy studies. This grand scholarly accomplishment is remarkable for a researcher who is less than 10 years in the professorate. This kind of expansive interdisciplinary intervention he can make in a single book is of a quality of work scholars make in the climax of their careers after three or four decades in academia where the, where the accumulated experiences flourish in one remarkable publication. If we were to summarize what Iheka has achieved in Ecomedia, it would be that he has indeed acquitted himself as quote, the golden boy of African studies. If Ecomedia is indicative of the new consciousness and radical turn in the humanistic sciences that embrace cultural critiques that are mindful of and attentive to an injured and endangered global ecology, it points a path to the ways in which culture, especially cultural representation, offers crucial insights into a reckless frenzy at resource mining in Africa. The compelling case it makes is that, quote, we need to turn to African media to 
to understand the socio-ecological implications of resource extraction on the continent in order to begin the work of examining co-conscious futures that sidestep the repetition of the problematic present. In doing so, the work functions to diagnose the current global ecological crisis through the prism of representation and as to how culture serves to direct us to new paths of environmental, social healing and harmony. In focusing in what he calls the ecology of images and the images of ecology uh, pertaining um, in Africa, Iheka not only aims to remedy the scandalous inattention given to quote African cultural artifacts in IKEA media studies, but also instantiates and models a discourse of amelioration that focuses on the remedial ways in which these media texts denounce environmental despoilation and emphasize and favor an ethics of ecological and human care that is attentive to what he calls alternative media practices suitable for an era of ecological precarity. Now, part of what constitutes a scholarly rigor is the attentiveness to the paradoxes and contradictions in media production, distribution, and consumption. What I mean here is that while the work is attentive to the scathing critiques mounted by different African media forms on the plundering of the continent and depredations of human life, the work does not ignore the intricate ways in which the global media infrastructure is directly imbricated in the international economy of toxicity and the mass ruination of lives and ecosystems that they critique. Media representations of different forms help to call attention to the unfolding ecological catastrophes happening in Africa. But as Ihe can note, quote, they equally they are equally tethered to social and ecological degradation in Africa from their production, distribution, consumption, and disposal. Part of what Iheka calls attention to in his work are the invisible operations responsible for the ecological and human devastation that African eco-media document. In doing so, he shows us how literary and cultural criticism cannot afford to be a bystander in the network world in which both production and destruction, fortune and misfortune, excess wealth and precarity, and the environment and human life are intricately interlocked. The major interdisciplinary intervention the work makes then is how it models a proactive and socially just, quote, ecological media studies for the 21st century. Given the current situation in which STEM programs are prioritized over the humanities, Iheka models for us how the liberal arts can go beyond a focus on authorial virtuosity and be a force for collective social good. By combining the tools of literary analysis with the intellectual commitment to social and economic development central to African studies and energy studies, Iheka demonstrates how cultural criticism can be mobilized in the search for quote, solutions to intellectual and social problems, plaguing a rapidly changing and uncertain world. In other words, at a moment when the world doubts the utility of liberal education, Iheka shows how literary and cultural studies, and by extension, the humanities, can go beyond aesthetic considerations to engage in problem analysis. It is this new ethos, the problem analysis, the book on Earth and its interpretation of Wanori Kahui's Ponzi and Fabrice Montero's The Prophecy. Both genres deploy waste aesthetics to suggest a project of futurity that works consciously to repair and heal a wounded global ecology. Ponzi does, uh, um, Kahui's Ponzi does so through an Afrofuturist Afro text that combines elements of science fiction with local Kihui cosmology and Judeo-Christian myths. Focusing close on Aisha, the female protagonist in the film, Iheka teases out the multiple endeavors by the strong female hero to reinvent a system designed to poison the world through nuclear munitions. Aisha's actions are determined by her main quote, desire to overcome the ecological crisis threatening planetary existence 
that she sees around the environment where she works as a laboratory technician. Rather than use the rich oil sample in creating lethal nuclear munitions, she opts to use it according to Hega to grow a nursery plant from the seed stored in the museum. And when the growth potential is established, she breaks out to find a new home for the root and for humanity. Now, Iheka's reading of Kumsi suggests that newness and futurity come about not through fidelity to routine and the status quo, but to what he calls radical departure, which suggests protests, counterculture, and resistance. I will argue that Aisha's countercultural persona also suggests the breaks and protests we need to carry out in literary and cultural studies if we desire to transcend the disciplinary limitations imposed on us, especially if we desire to have concrete social impacts on the material world. But if Aisha is an iconoclast, that radical that rebels against the system in order to reinvent the world, he can essentially mounts a form of intellectual insurgency, deploying the tools of cultural analysis in the interpretation of cultural artifacts located in disciplines far removed from literary studies, all in the desperate bid to find answers to a world plagued by relentless terrestrial vandalism and human exploitation and entanglement. We see this Paul, deft master- I'm gonna interrupt. Okay. One more minute. One more minute. Okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. We see deft marshalling and reinvention of the tools of cultural analysis in his reading of Montero's The Prophet. The photo essay, as Iheka rightly notes, is a visual chronicle that critiques the culture of consumption and waste intrinsic to postmodernity. But the point Iheka makes, and which is one I want to emphasize here, is that visual texts themselves do not account for all of the invisible histories that are central to their meaning. And what Heike does in his work then is in the manner of the photographs to exhume those histories that are buried behind the images that we see. And it is this rich tapestry of reading that exhumes um, invisible histories buried behind text that he brings to bear on the sort of thoughtful, deep and insightful analysis that he offers about the, way, the commentaries that these texts make on ecological devastation and the new paths that we need to take to heal and reinvent the world. So it is truly, truly an honor to be part of this panel, reviewing the work of um, a scholar that I truly, truly believe has redefined the path of African literature and cultural studies in very fundamental ways. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was great. It, um very rich with the sense of returning to these questions of art of humanities. And I think you're exactly right. Kajetan's book is very firm in the humanities, but also certainly in the American context will speak outside it and is very useful for intervening into those STEM debates. Henry, is it possible for us to return to you now just for you know five yeah. minutes worth of comments so we can I, I, really, to say. I really wish to come back. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. If uh, you can hear me, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come back. And I really wish to congratulate uh, Professor Iheka once more. Um, and I wish to thank all those who have presented uh, after me. And um, they have really touched many of the things I really have on my uh, paper to discuss. But I just really want to do this final note uh, shortly. Um, um, mining from what I have uh, seen from Ihika's uh, um, uh, writing uh, is a major phenomenon in uh, on the African continent because uh, miners believe that Africa harbors in its belly uh, natural resources and they have to get it. Now, for me, mining imposes the burden of excavation on the earth. And uh, in the location where it is going to happen, there are certain questions that have come to my mind, which I think um, uh, Professor Iheka has also been asking. What happens to that part of the earth whenever it is mined? 
what happens to habitats in that part of the earth in relation to human beings, fauna, and um, flora. I think the book has opened our eyes to the reality of uh, the harm that mining of natural resources has done to Africa's ecological system. But beyond that, the book has read that Florable logical situation of the continent has now become sources of inspiration for the works of painters, fine artists, film producers, and photographers. Now, if you check chapter three of your book with the photographs presented on the Niger Delta situation with a title Ecologies of Oil and Uranium, what is presented with a very grim, um, a very grim experience of the Niger Delta community. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, these situations in earlier presentations, but I would just want to conclude by saying that the concluding uh, paragraph of chapter three, which is really touching to me, brings out a question that all of us should think about. Will Africa someday disappear from the earth? Thank you very much. Henry, thank you for being concise. I mean, you said earlier on that this is one of the books that most challenged you. I think Paul said that um, Kajan is now the golden boy of African studies. <laughs> He's a very heady plaudit. Uh, I'm sure Kajitan will be eager to respond to them. But um, before we turn over to Kajitan, can I ask um, our audience, if anyone has any questions, please just type them into the chat and I will ask them um, to Kajitan. Kajitan, please, um, do you want to respond to uh, the comments? Yes, please. Um, yeah, that's just, yeah, no words, no words, really. Uh, I don't want to say, you know, gratitude and uh, appreciation to uh, all the panelists, really, for taking the time to read and um, think with me and for their generous engagement with the book. You know, I've I've just been taking notes, you know, I've been taking notes here. Um, and it's really been, yeah, it's really, it's really been an, you know, just really a pleasure, honor uh, to listen to all of you, you know. Um, many of you have been friends, have been interlocutors, and, you know, you're terrific scholars in your own right, you know, to speak about my work in this way, you know, leaves me with so much joy and gratitude. So thank you, thank you. I will respond you know, to some of the things that come up, you know, but I think I should also, I should also thank Brian too for uh, not just sharing this panel, but right with one of the last engagements I had, the last, the last supper, I would say, before, <laughs> before the pandemic was with um, um, Brian Larkin, you know, Brian, Byron Satangelo and some colleagues here, Michael Warner um, including, uh, included. And this was at the occasion of um, a manuscript workshop on this book, you know. So I want to thank Brian for agreeing to read the book and come to New Haven, you know, uh, to talk about it. Whatever goodness is in this book was amplified, was improved, was strengthened, you know, with that, you know. Um, and other people have invited me to speak and um, who've read chapters and speak at their universities. And um, so, yeah, so really all I'm, you can see that most of what I have today is just gratitude to, um, for the support of this book, but also for the support of my formation that has made it possible for me to be able to write this book. Um, yeah, Naminata talk about, talked about the centrality of Africa in the work, and you know, really, that's really what I wanted to get out of this. And then, you know, to one limit of the book, and she is right, in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo really is at the center really of everything that I'm that I have said in this book. And I agree that that is um that is a that is a limitation of the book. And I hope you know that others who are gonna write, who are gonna do some of this work. It's interesting that I just I've just reviewed a proposal for Chicago. Um, you know, it's a book proposal for the work of a prominent eco critic. And, it, and interestingly, one of the comments I said is that, you know, that the African section, you know, is lacking, you know, lacking attention on, you know, the Congo. So it's interesting that I just wrote that earlier this week and then, you know, it's come to bite me today. Um, thank you, Naminata, for, 
for drawing my attention to it. Yeah, you've challenged me to to go back and um, to think, you know, to go back to, because it's, it's also a place where a lot of cultural productions are coming out. Most recently too, I, there's the New York Times article on, you know, peat, you know, peat, you know, which is very essential for carbon, you know, carbon storage, you know, and the exploitation of that in the Congo and trying to keep it in the ground. Um, so, um, I don't, I don't, I think, you know, my future work in this area will definitely touch more on that. And Henry, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Henry, for, you know, for your comments, you know, and, and I'm intrigued by your final question about the disappearance of Africa. I, I, I think I'm, I can, I know that things look gloomy, but I can emphatically say that you know Africa is going nowhere because you know it's really it's really the center it's really the center it's really the center of the world you know we're going nowhere and really um, you know having just returned from Lagos to the you know the strength of the continent I think lies in, in the young people the young people the young people who are there and the amazing things they're doing and they're making possible despite the immigration despite the you know the challenges there. So I think you know that the continent you know can only can only you know can only go up from here, and, and I think you know even the rest of the world recognizes that you know some of the some of the investments in Africa today, some of the outreach to Africa today is in recognition of um, of its location as a future, as every place as everywhere else gets exhausted. You know I think you know the continent will remain. You know, a place. However, that does not mean then that we should be complacent. That okay, well, we'll be Africa will be fine. You know, I think you know these problems that we're drawing attention to, um, the chart some of the challenges that the artists I'm looking at uh, invested in. You know, they, they demand the demand the demand sober assessment and um, attention. Um, but but more importantly, I think you know that in Africa will. You know the continent will survive. You know this, um, this, this challenges. But you know the question. But the question that I think I want to pose back, and I think we should be, we should live with at the end is, you know, in what form will the continent survive? I think you know this is a question. I hope we can, we can live with as we end um, the conversation today. Um, so thank you, Henry. Um, um, so now I talked about you know the, you know the idea of insightful reading that I that I that I mentioned in the book and this uh, this came up in in the other with the other um, pan, um, panelists as well um the idea of planetary humanism which you I, I and I agree with you um the rehumanizing of the West you know because it's it's always been central to it's always you know these practices of ecological entanglement you know thinking across species has always been central to African community, you know. My first, I talked a little bit about, about you know, Arrow of God and um, and the way that Chuna Chube, you know, brings that up with the case of the Python. Um, and we see that in the other communities that I cited, you know, and I'm sure we see that in your own ongoing project, you know, um, looking at the environmental consciousness of the Ugu people. You know, in um, in Nigeria too. So that I mean, I'm that's part of what I'm excited about your project. It's really move taking moving us away from you know the contemporary in a way and taking us back to this you know century old um, you know knowledge, uh, centuries old indigenous systems you know, that have sustained communities. That you know part of what my book is doing. Part of what I but I what I think your book will especially do in a very special way is to remind us again, it's to center, you know, this African cultural systems that even as we speak today about entanglement, as we talk today about, you know, critical animal studies, you know, part of this is doing and your work too, is to show us that, well, you know, the so-called primitive people, the so-called Africans are primitive peoples, they've always, you know, valued, you know, these practices that will come into shape today. I think you know that's that's something that is um um central. You draw attention to page seventeen of the book. You know, I love I love I love when you know when a critic goes you know gives you the page number and the line number. It's it's amazing um, about internationalism and my idea of the nation. I think I I use I use nation um, you know loosely 
Um, because I think of, you know, and in fact, one could argue that, you know, what Nigeria is that Nigeria is not the nation like that. We can think of the nation as those empires we're talking about, the Benin Empire and the rest of them, you know, that those were really nations were broken up, you know, to create these countries, you know, this, um, com you know, these countries at amalgamation. So when I looked at nation, at, at the moment, at those, at, before, before before global era, you know, you know, the Benin Empire, for example, traded, you know, um, that was trading on the coast of the Indian Ocean, for example. But but more importantly, those those territories, you know, the sovereignty was really central. Um, the territories were central, you know. And I'm thinking about the wars, in, you know, that surrounded the Benin Empire, for example, as symbolic of this in the notions of self inclusion. That this relationship with others, you know, did not did not in any way mean the dissolution of or the granting or the surrender of certain sovereignties to those other entities. So when I say nation, I use the term loosely to think of these functions that preceded in a contemporary moment, um, you know, that emphasize you know territorial integrity. And we see that even even in even. A, when I, uh, you know, in in, in a way, recently I was talking to, you know, one um, principal scholar who is retired now, and you know, describing how they came to the United States to study, stayed at, at Wisconsin Madison in the seventies, married an American woman, but he did not stay here, you know, home, home, you know, it was important to go back home in a way that is not important, you know, for all, you know, for this, you know, in this particular moment. So even in that conversation, I began to see the distinction between some of the old and the new, in addition to the economic precarity that has since attended to, um, you know, the, um, academia in places of, in places like Nigeria. Um, so yeah, so this is not to knock, you know, the past. But to marginalize in you know, African, African um, modes of belonging in the past, you know, I see them, you know, as nations in their right before, um, before they were dismantled. The other thing I would say, and I, I want to come to the end, so that if we have questions from the audience or comments, we can take them. I want to come back. I want to come to Marion. You know, I'm actually meeting. You know, for the first time. You know, it's very nice to meet you, Marion. Thank you, and I will be sure to follow your work. You know, going forward. Um, um, yeah, you know, and you, you, you know, you raised an important problem. You know, and you know. Paul come, you know, came to this when he talked about the powers of media production. That on the one hand, you have you know, this work by Ugo and the rest of them with the ability, with the affordance of circulation. They are able to travel, but they're also steeped in, they're also implicated in this kind of networks. And then you have you know, this other terrific cultural, cultural artifact you know, that may carry less carbon footprint, may have less carry and, and baggage, and this that works, but their circulation, you know, is limited. And then, if we're thinking about you know, the efficiency or the effectiveness of artistic advocacy, the question becomes, you know, which work, which of these works, have much potential to, you know, to, um, you know, to make, you know, to make, to make an impact. So all I can say really is to say that yes, I, I do, I do hear you, and. Um, it is a paradox that I, you know, that I grew with, you know, as I, as I, as I uh, worked on this project. But I was also very intentionally deliberate that I wanted to touch on different range of of different artistic productions, not just the small, small production, but also this blockbuster, these big ones with all the problems. But the hope ultimately is that you know we move. That you know that imperfect media become more mainstream. The kind of media forms that African artists are producing become more mainstream. Um, you know, you talked about urban space, you know, and you know, and and I, you know, I come with all humility, you know, as a scholar of of the urban and African cultural productions. Um, but I think it's in the arts, the arts, you know, being produced, you know, that is where we see the radical possibilities, you know. In Lagos, I was introduced to the, you know, to the work of this, you know, this, you know, teenagers, you know, called the Kurudu Boys, as some of you have seen. They are remixing, they are remixing of, you know, you know, blockbuster movies and art, you know, with just limited 
with limited resources at their disposal. I think, you know, for me, this is in such works that I find in the creativity, um, that I find the creativity that is necessary to reimagine. You know, again, taking a place like Lagos as, as gosh, it's just so much. There is just so much, you know. I, I I just can't I can't I can't quantify I can't quantify it. So it seems to me that is in those um is a creative imagination of the stickers coming out of these African cities that what we need the radical possibilities for the future uh, will 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 you know really come from. Um, um, finally, you know um. Paul talked about breaking out on radical departures in Pumzi and you know, in evocatively linked it, linked it to really breaking out of you know, breaking out of disciplinary modes in literary and cultural studies, which I really think, and you know, I think is a good summation of the book, you know, that, that is I well, that's what I hope will come out of this, that you know other scholars, especially, you know. Uh, and I'm not talking about junior scholars taking something from the book. I hope if it takes something, it will be permission, you know, permission to break the modes that we've come to know about reading and writing, you know, um, in the humanities to that. So I'm going to leave it there and say once again, you know, thank you to the panelists for, for such an extraordinary, extraordinary engagement, you know, um, with, the, with different aspects of, of the book. You know, I, I see the book in new ways, you know, really having, having come from listening to you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we only have a few minutes to go as the LSA organizers and hosts are telling us. If anyone does have a question from the audience, please post it in there. Uh, in the meantime, I would just like to read and listening to everyone is fantastic. Two of the things that really come over are the diversity of media that you look at. Um, the cold production from to literature to mm. photography um, to mm. medium or generally go back to the base elements of extraction and we end mm. up with the dumping. Um, I would have comments on the Victor, uh, the Peter Hugo stuff for another time. Um, but then the other thing, which I wasn't thinking of as much, but I think Senayon brought up very strongly, is this issue of scale. Mm. You know, we have used three, we have used African, continental, we have used Nigeria, mm. used Delta. If you use Agbogbloshi, when we talk of pollution, if we talk about physical pollution, it has a natural end. Those toxins mm -hmm. will spread so far mm -hmm. and lessen. And if we talk about other forts of networks and connections, we're moving. So you're moving with these media between these different scales, which poses the question for African studies. Where should analysis be? And I think part of what you've done for me is really open up these questions. I honestly do think it's a landmark book in that because you're not just analyzing questions of eco-media and unlike everyone else on this panel, I'm far less of a scholar of literature, but my work, my work is primarily on media and you ask different questions about media. You ask us to think of media in different ways, not just in terms of the text, that they circulate, though you never give up on those texts, but also from its base elements and every other level. And I think we could go on. I was recently read a wonderful um, uh, dissertation on Computer Village by Ali Sala, a recent graduate from um, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And it's all, it's a different, it's not the Agbog Bloshi end of recycling. It's what mm -hmm. happens when you take these you, um, you know, old computers, you recycle, you combine them, you resell them. So recycling enters into this domain. And from their point of view, they don't see this as toxic dumping. Mm -hmm. they, they see this as a necessary part of their business model. And they're against the Basel conventions and other attempts to change this. Mm -hmm. So a different, Depending on where we in these modes, mm -hmm. we will get different sets of investments in these questions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with that, I just had one question for you, which is, as you switch to look at, look beyond literature, to open up to these different questions, does it shift how your analysis takes place? Does it force you to move beyond textuality, to open up different questions, or do you see your work in literature as training you very well? Uh, for moving on it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. You know, I think I'll answer this by saying, you know, one of the, I was just 
I was telling someone that be a good international scholar, you know, I think you need to be grounded in a discipline. You need to know your discipline first I mean, before you can be an international scholar. And I think literary studies, you know, um, it's, it's, it's attentiveness to close reading as, you know, really was a good starting point, a good point, you know, a resourceful asset, you know, for working on this book. Um, however, you know, I felt, I felt it wasn't, it wasn't sufficient, it wasn't enough. And the advantage of a second book is that there's no supervisor over and over you, you know, reminding you to stay within, to stay in line, you know. So I was able to do the kind of roaming, the kind of roaming I couldn't do in this first book, you know. But it meant I had to learn things. I had to go to do other play, other thing, other books, other to learn, you know, how to. But I wanted to break the textual mode. I really wanted to put the text in the world, you know, in rich, in rich, evocative ways, um, so that. Literary criticism was a good starting point, but I, I wanted to supplement it. And that's what I had to do in this book. Yeah. And so um, just to end, do any of the panelists have a question for Kajitan or a comment or a comment on each other? Um, can I offer the last word to someone? If not, then I will um, follow the LSAs and, and wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for your participation, for reading with such care, for presenting. I'm sorry for the technological glitches. Mm -hmm. However, I'm personally totally fascinated intellectually with issues of rape now. To think mm -hmm. like this are always grist for the mill. Kajitan, mm -hmm. congratulations. This really is a landmark book. Um, I'm certainly yeah. going to teach with it. It's going to live mm -hmm. part of my um, intellectual imagination, and I'm sure I won't be the only one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so congratulations to you and to everyone else and to the panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you for attending yeah. and goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to recommend this book to two oh, of my thank you. Yes. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time, everyone. See yeah. everybody. Uh, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.